Hello and welcome to episode 14 of Me Novel's World. Again, thank you all for tuning in every week and thank you for all the support uh, in regards to, uh, you know, my, my protest, uh, the fact that I'm having a baby soon in July and uh, just hearing all of these and not just people calling me up, but also emailing me and sending me messages on Instagram. Just having these messages makes everything so much better. Uh, I'll be very honest, it's it's been quite difficult now in my third trimester. I mean, <laughs> I'm getting heavier, uh, the baby's growing, I'm getting more breathless, <laughs> just even walking up the stairs to go into the bathroom or, or even just cleaning up the dishes. Just very small things like that are, are making me breathless, but I just have to keep reminding myself that well, I have another human going inside me, so uh, it is it is normal. Um, I... I'll be honest, I, this lockdown is, is starting to get to me. I, I feel the, the gap and the hole in my life with the lack of communication. Uh, I like going into work and just even like saying good morning to everyone, making a cup of tea for my patients or even for my colleagues and the other doctors or sitting in the cafe and having lunch. Like those are those are things that I always took for granted, and you know I, I really wish I could go back and do all of that because it brings it brings some sense of normality and it, it brings me joy to to communicate and to socialize. But I'm trying to hang on. I'm trying to use this time as as productively as possible and spend time learning new things. Um, it's easier said than done because I mean I spend most of my day. Uh, watching Money Heist so (laughs) productivity wise not so great today but hopefully over the next few weeks I can I can just get my head together the weather is getting much much nicer here in the UK I have called someone in to do my garden so I have a nice back garden now where I can sit down read a book and hopefully these small things um, will will help me feel better and I think you know always have to help yourself first really and then only you can expect things to to get better from there i know it's easier said than done again um but anyway this week uh we have anila uh she's an award-winning presenter and producer so anila chaudhary is someone who i saw on on tv a few months ago and i saw her on a, a tv show called good morning britain which is one of the most watched shows in in early morning especially across the UK and she was sitting on a panel with very well spoken people very well read people not that I'm comparing her to anybody but you know she was with a tough crowd over there and they were talking about Prince Harry and and Meghan Markle uh, a very controversial topic and you know she spoke so well so elegantly and she really she you know really struck a chord with me I was like wow that's incredible a you know, South Asian woman sitting on a panel with uh, her British counterparts just really struck something inside me. And I thought, wow, this is something I, I, I can aspire to. And then from there, I just I started following her and seeing her work. Um, and through our conversation, she talks about how in her own family, she was inspired by her own aunts. And she was gen- she was just surrounded by females who were excelling in their own careers at a time where being a woman in any industry wasn't easy so it was very interesting to see where this confidence and where her personality sort of stems from i also spoke to anila about the importance of journalism especially at a crucial time like like now in this pandemic and how it's so important we are aware of of, of news and information we consume because there's a lot going on on social media on tv and it can it can get overwhelming, but it's still really important that we read the right stuff and we are informed in the right way. And, you know, she speaks about how she feels she has a responsibility to help society come out of this much more informed, much more knowledgeable, and generally as a much more united society. And, you know, she talks about speaking the truth and as... <laughs> quite clear that that's something I advocate for as well and it's something I've been fighting for which is the truth and you know transparency as well we're living in a time now where there's so much news to consume that we don't actually know what's right and wrong and we can even get ourselves in a bit of a of a model so I I really enjoyed this episode and one thing that stuck out to me the most when I was speaking to Anila was 
what her plans for the future are. And when I asked her, where do you see yourself in the next 10 years? What do you see yourself doing? Her, her response was something that was very profound. And I won't spoil it for you. I'll let you find out. So without further ado, this is Anila Jaldri. Thank you for joining me uh, today, Anila. I know you're very busy as a, as a journalist and a reporter, especially during these times, but I really appreciate your time today. Thank you for having me. Hmm. Well, what, what's it been like, Anila, I mean, working at the front line as well, just like all doctors, nurses and healthcare workers? You know, we can't forget our reporters and journalists who are doing such great work to get stories out. Well, um, I could never equalise our work to that of doctors and nurses because they really are on the front line. And, um, you know, and seeing that silent war that everyone's calling it really bare in their faces and that's a real threat. Um, but, yeah, I mean, uh, as the government officially calls us, we are frontline workers mm. and key workers. Um but it's been a huge responsibility, I would say. It's felt like a duty to the nation. It's felt like the news has never been more important, um, especially not in my lifetime anyway. Um, and it's felt like people not only go to the news for information, but it's a kind of a source of hope. So, you know, sitting down as a family and waiting for Boris Johnson's speech that's going out to the nation Mm. and then kind of dissecting and analysing and breaking it apart so people understand what it means or what it means for them. That's kind of been a source of hope in a way that uh, is, are things improving? Um, Is our nation coming together in a certain way? So even the the practical lockdown was in a sense hope because you're like, actually the government's doing something drastic now to help people. So it's just felt like a really important time. Um, and yeah like a real duty to to the nation and to to everyone who consumes the news in whatever way they're consuming it mm. to to give them information that's vital to their every day especially now when they're at home yeah well anila i think the the concern i have at least and this is why i'm i'm doing these podcasts is that we seem to have different facets to the story of of what's happening right in terms of the pandemic so we have our daily press briefings, whether it's in the UK or or anywhere else across the world, everyone is is experiencing the same thing. We have the politicians telling us one thing. And then I can't talk for other countries, but specifically in the UK, at least, it seems like behind the walls of a hospital, something else is happening. Uh, There's a big disparity in, or a big communication gap, I would say, between what the politicians are saying and what the reality is. Now, as a journalist, how do you how do you get your head around all of this? How do you choose which stories to cover? Because obviously there's so much going on and you work for other people. So in terms of trying to stay apolitical sometimes or trying to <laughs> sort of bite your tongue, I mean, how, how do you deal with all of this? I think that the the way that you've put it is really um, a good way to explain where journalists fit in. So where people feel that there's a gap between politicians and the reality I think journalists are that bridge so we bridge that gap and that's always been where I've seen my role and responsibility so in whatever case or in whatever way I can I will try to bridge that gap so either you know questioning politicians or questioning what they've said at least to then make that relevant to people but also put it in context of what does that actually mean in the bigger picture okay so uh, we've done x amount of testing okay the government said they've met their target they've exceeded their target wow Mm. okay really have they um you know how many of those tests haven't been done how many of those have been sent to people's homes and none opened you know Mm. um so it's all about um bridging that gap and making people aware of the reality um when it comes yeah making people aware of the reality bridging that gap and just being a source of truth so you know you mentioned that I work for different people um and I am a freelance journalist but for me the reason I'm in journalism is to give people the truth and to be a voice Mm. of truth and to be a voice of um you know I think journalists try and stay away from the word justice because we're not there to give anyone justice in a way 
um, because you've got to be impartial. But if you're a voice of truth, you're always a voice of justice. And that's the mm. way I see it. So even when I have to stay, you know, in inverted commas, apolitical on my social media or whatever, I tend not to because I think, well, I'm not going to keep my mouth closed when I see that something's mm. not the truth or is not factual. Mm. Well, that that must be quite difficult for you sometimes because as a if you're working for a specific company or a news agency, surely there are times where they say, try stay away from this or try stay away from that. Has that happened to you, especially during this pandemic, where there's something you want to say or something you want to get out, but you've been you've been held back by by your seniors? Um, do you know what? I have to say absolutely not. Um, OK, great. Yeah, <laughs> no. Um, and I know what you mean, that, you know, some news channels might come across that, you know, some news channels are perceived as worse. I have to say, look, let's just get it out there. The BBC gets so much flack. And I obviously do work um, as a freelancer for the BBC World Service. But I, all of the journalists that I work with have so much integrity. I think the BBC has been the go-to place for people during this pandemic. And I really hope that, you know, people who have been so against it um, before the pandemic started, I hope they can see just how important it really is as a public service to people. Because, the, you know, and the seniors that I work with have always, you know, throughout the whole pandemic have been welcoming to all ideas all angles um and the other thing is that I would only ever pitch something that I think needs to be heard that I think Mm. is giving people something that they need to know and generally when you work in an organization you work with people that you think have the same values as you um so I've never been held back by any of my seniors because we all hold the Mm. same values that we want to you know, impart knowledge, the truth to people in an impartial and unbiased way. Yeah, but it seems, I mean, obviously your your case is quite unique, Anila, where you do have the support and you're all working towards bringing the truth out. And it's pretty much what all doctors want and healthcare workers want at this point, right? We just want the truth and and justice, as you said. Yeah. Uh, but there are journalists who are, who are not like that. <laughs> I mean, if you look at the front pages of, of the news today, you know, they're talking about easing lockdown. And then automatically, you know, the public are just going to be outside having their picnics and we could just hit a second peak again. And it's worrying because unfortunately they have some power in what the public are consuming mm. and what the public believe. Now, as a journalist who who's against these these sort of things, how does how does that make you feel? Because you're working in an environment which can potentially sort of corrupt your own values right at some times where you're just like well these are what the journalists are doing but this is not what I'm doing and you must get fed up at some point (laughs) and be like what kind of sort of industry am I working in and I feel the same way as a doctor right where I'm working in the NHS and I love the NHS and I love I love what it stands for but after seeing everything you know there have been days where I'm just like what what am I even doing this for and why am I even part of this Mm. Have you felt that way where you feel like, well, my voice might not be heard or my story might not get out and other people might win in terms of who gets the front headline? Uh, Yeah, I I see what you mean. Um, And of course, you know, newspapers have a completely different agenda to Mm. um, and they have different rules to TV and radio, which I'm in. You know, um, I don't work for any of the papers. Um, so they have completely different guidelines and the power that newspapers have is absolutely phenomenal. But, you know, journalists like me who work in TV and radio, we get a limited amount of time to reach people, um, uh, you know, within the like one hour slot or whatever we might have. We have social media and social media is a huge voice. And so that's really the platform Mm. where you can actually challenge um, what's on the front pages, all the headlines, um, you know, even even something like the the professor Neil Ferguson yeah. uh, resigning after his uh, affair, and you you have to look at all of that. You know, I look at that as a journalist, and I think, and that's one thing that I have been actually doing is 
looking at all the front pages, looking at the headlines and how has that been portrayed? Uh, mm. Because one of the things that I did, one thing I'm really passionate about is, um, you know, smashing those kinds of stereotypes that the woman's always blamed in these scenarios yeah. in cases yeah. her picture's been bigger than his has, whereas he's the one we've been seeing in the, he's the one we've been seeing in the news. So mm. people would recognise him more than her. Um, so why is she even on the front page? Why is there even a picture of her? It's all those things that you have to, I, I personally take on board to then put on my social media and my Twitter accounts and reach mm. people that way to say, actually, look, you know, you have to challenge what you're seeing. Um, mm. And and one thing I have to say with the newspapers during the pandemic is that they did rally the nation together. They have got people to clap for the NHS and they have um, showed unity um, in for Britain at this difficult time. And I have been proud of the newspapers in that sense where, you know, all this hatred and division that you normally mm. see in them, the, you know, that has been put to one side to put the nation, you know, as a collective together during this. So I've liked that aspect, but you are right. Obviously, they do have an agenda and they definitely, you know, had an agenda when they were saying um, that, you know, the lockdown should be lifted. I think that, that mm. was about a week or two ago when there was all these headlines, you know, lockdown mm. should be lifted, people should be allowed to go out. And it was so ridiculous. It was just mm. like, OK, you can see that the newspaper is trying to rally people together to get them fired up and saying, yeah, why is the government not lifting lockdown now? Um, but again, you just have to reach people like you can't get fed up in that scenario because that's what the papers do. That's their job. That's their agenda. You have I particularly feel like I am not involved in that um, to the extent that I'm part of it. I am involved um, in the aftermath, in challenging it and helping people realise um, that actually not everything you read is the truth. Don't take everything as face value and look at it from a different angle to maybe get a different perception. And how how would what what suggestion do you have to someone who's listening in right now, who's obviously probably overwhelmed with all the news that's coming in? You've got Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and then let's not forget all the fake news that's been circulating around mm. as well in different parts of the world. As a young millennial who's keen on learning and keen on being part of a big bigger change for the world. What is your suggestion as to how they should consume the right news? Well, one thing I do is when I'm not working, I consume very little, to be honest, mm. especially during this time, because I think that you have to look after your own well-being and um, consuming all of the nonsense that's sent on WhatsApp, you know, these forwarded videos and your friends' Facebook videos or whatever it is, like, it's unnecessary. It adds nothing to your life. Um, so being a bit um, particular about what you're digesting. And when it comes to fake news, you have to, I mean, what I do to really get a balanced perspective is I follow journalists from different publications, um, left wing, wing, right wing, centre. I follow everything to make sure I've got mm. a really balanced opinion because some, you know, someone will say something and I'm like, oh yeah, that's a brilliant point. And then I see it written in a completely different way. And I think, oh, actually that point's really good as well. And then you think, well, I, I either have an opinion on it or now I don't have an opinion because actually they both make sense. So mm. I would suggest that people follow you know, a rounded collection of, um, you know, journalists, publications, um, and not, you know, and be open minded. And then also just don't consume too much. Yeah, I think it's also really important to engage your own brain as well when you're reading, because sometimes we become quite we sort of mindlessly read passive just things yeah, yeah and it passive, just becomes passively yeah. taken information. And as a journalist, yeah. I, you know, I'm trained in constantly questioning everything but people have to take that responsibility as well and question everything you read mm. well I don't know just to confirm your thing is still recording yeah yeah okay good. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't be able to repeat all of this again <laughs> um so Anila your 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 perception on, on journalism and getting the truth out and justice out seems to be one that's very inspiring and 
I, I wonder where all of this came from. I mean, what was what was your journey like to to go into the media? So I did my first work experience when I was 15 and and that was at a local radio station. Um, and then I joined a an organisation called Headliners that helps young people and they quickly saw my kind of passion and I suppose call it talent for being on screen and talking to people and interviewing. And I did so much with them. Um, one of the things I did was stand in Parliament and interview MPs uh, when I was 16 and ask them why they won't lower, lower the voting age. And since then, I think I'd always, I was always like, actually, journalists have a direct channel to people who are decision makers. And mm. if we can stand there questioning people who are actually running the show, running our society, making decisions that affect our daily lives. If I can be there questioning and challenging them, I can be a voice for people and and make change in my way. So um, that was really the kind of catalyst for me when I saw actually I can have communication with these people. And I mean, I was 16 at the time. So, and you know, I'm from like a village turned into a small town and I was like oh my god I can have access to these people who are at the top um Hmm. and so that was kind of inspiring for me as well that I can do this and um so yeah I took it from there and I Hmm. carried on doing that and where where were you born Anila I was born in Essex Mm -hmm. um yeah and were, were, were you surrounded by many other inspiring South Asian women at that time or um in my household yes uh my okay. uh, I attribute a lot to my aunts um mm-hmm. they were kind of pioneers uh in their own way especially for the time they grew up in where uh asian women weren't really um encouraged to get an education and follow their own path um mm-hmm. and one of my aunts was you know a south asian woman who did an, her PhD in science at Imperial. Uh, my other aunt uh, is a lawyer and in law. And so they're all really educated. I used to have science kits, books, um, and education was really pushed in my household, as well as kind of challenging mm. the stereotypes, standing up for yourself, being a voice uh, for women and seeing kind of no difference in men and women. Um, so, yeah, they were really kind of my role models and inspirations growing up and and were your family supportive and encouraging when you when you made the decision to go into into the media yeah always um I could never have done it without their support my parents are my biggest supporters you know they're so proud um and their their line is always you know what next what more you know keep going and they love it. I think they really love the industry <laughs> themselves. Mm. They love it. They love what I do, and um, it makes them really proud. So, I've, yeah, I've always had that support. But Anila, I'm sure when you were younger and you were watching TV or even listening to the radio, I'm sure a lot of the the news that you consumed at that time was not from South Asian women. Maybe not even women. I'm sure there were, at that time. It was mainly male dominated mm. or British dominated. So how did you feel at the age of 16? Did you ever like question yourself and think, well, I'm a South Asian woman or girl at that time. How can I make my mark in this big industry that's so huge and so difficult to navigate through? Did you ever think about that? Or were you just with the mindset that this is what I want to do and I'm just going to go? I actually wasn't of that mindset. And I would attribute that really to my parents for instilling just a kind of unwavering confidence in me. Um, Mm. And I find it hard to explain how that's come about, really, because I don't know what they've done in their parenting. But I was always really confident. Um, And I think because everyone around me believed in me so much, I never had reason to doubt myself. Um, Mm. uh, and I mean I I was in a predominantly um, white school primary school secondary school sixth form but I never saw any difference Uh, I don't think I ever was in an environment that 
pointed out that I was either Asian or a woman. Um, I think the only time I ever really came to acknowledge it was when I was running as a candidate for the Women's Equality Party. And mm. um, and I was like, wow, OK, yeah, politics is very um, kind of non-inclusive. So I was really happy to be a member of the Women's Equality Party and as an Asian woman representing there because I thought, actually, this is a really male-dominated place. Um, that's mm. the only time I ever actually became kind of self-aware in that sense Mm. um that's interesting because you know when I was a a young girl and I I was born and raised in Gibraltar and you know uh so it's life over there is very very different Mm. uh, to what we see here in the UK uh we've got so many different communities over there from Morocco from Pakistan India Spain and there's the inclusion is just something that's just there it's not something anyone ever discusses or tries to impose it's just there we're all very proud to be part of that little island and we're very happy to help each other when we want to so when I was younger and I was growing up I never felt oh I'm a South Asian girl this is my skin color um in fact it was opposite a lot of people would celebrate my our skin color and hair they'd be like oh your hair so you're beautiful and your skin is so nice you know just like seems so exotic to them and then when I came to the UK I realized that this is something people talk about People talk about being South Asian or being 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 an ethnic minority, and these are, were all new conversations to me over the last couple of years. Mm-hmm. So I think the idea of who will listen to me—I'm just a South Asian woman—for me at least is a more of an imposed idea mm-hmm. rather than something I feel myself. Yeah. Does that yeah, make sense? Yeah, that's really um, interesting because. Because a couple of weeks ago, when I did my protest and I went outside Downing Street, which was amazing, I never thought, <laughs> I never thought about my skin color, my background, my my national, like nothing. Mm. It was only when you know you just on Twitter and social media, and people are advocating for specific women to speak out. We've got some amazing doctors like Dr. Rosina Ali Khan, Dr. Sonia Adesara. These women are very outspoken, but people always label them with the South Asian Mm, woman mm. and then I started labeling myself with that as well so it's very interesting because I've come from a place where that didn't exist yeah to something like that and now I've (laughs) I feel like I've sort of gone into that black hole now where I'm thinking the same thing but I'm trying not to obviously because I think it just restricts your own you know vision it does and I just I I have always seen myself as much like generally, you know, as a as a, um, speaking more of an, on a spiritual level, but you know, I do see myself as a spirit in a human body, having a human experience, mm. and that you know we're all connected, we're all one. I've always had a very kind of um, holistic approach to my place in society and the world, and that you know I am one with this, with the people in this nation. I'm one with mm. the people in the world. And um, so that's really developed later in life. But uh, I suppose it comes from the grounding of there's more to me than all these identity, um, than my identity and all these labels that are put on me. Mm. And I think identifying as a South Asian woman is beneficial and useful if you're going to use it in a beneficial and useful way. Um, If it's going to help people or if it's to support a particular cause or um then it's helpful and yeah sure you know we should we are that is part one facet of our identity that um we should you know use as a beneficial way for other people when we need to but otherwise if it's going to hold you back um in any way because you've limited yourself Mm. not holding you back because of discrimination but you're holding yourself back because of your own limitation um then I just don't see any point in having to focus on it. I mean, yeah, big deal. Like, it's lovely. I love being South Asian. I love my culture. I love everything that comes with it, uh, the religious aspects, whatever. Um, But I'm not going to let it ever hold me back if I want to go out into wider society and do something. I'll never think, oh, my Mm. God, you know, I'm brown. Will I be accepted? But did you ever ever have this feeling, though, at any point in your career? Did you ever... For example, stand like, I mean, when you were 16, you were in parliament asking MPs questions. That's one example. Another example, maybe if, if you were reporting a story next to a British 
male counterpart. Did you ever feel intimidated? Has that ever crossed your mind at all? No. Wow, never. that's incredible. <laughs> um, uh, I just, I think that I'm so focused on my skills and doing the job right mm. and excelling in myself that I could never ever just think that you know oh I'm intimidated by this person because of my skin color like oh, yeah I never but I think that also I think my experience in life probably helps because I know that some people have experienced racism mm. and um I can't I, you know I've never experienced racism in any thing that I maybe once you know I can't even remember if it has so you know that's how insignificant it was to me mm. but you know what I mean is in places that I've actually cared about that I've needed a sense of belonging like school and university and sixth form um I've never experienced racism I've always had that sense of belonging um and never feeling like an outsider so um I've never never felt like Mm. that and also I suppose it's the comfort level as well you know comfortable in your own skin and comfortable around people who are of a different skin color you know I never look at somebody standing next to me and think oh you know they're white or they're Mm. black or they're Asian and they're brown or whatever um I just think well that's another person in my industry yeah yeah (laughs) yeah well no that that's that's really great to hear Anila I mean your story is quite unique, I think. I'm sure there are, if I spoke to another journalist, maybe they would have a different story and they yeah, would have felt, felt quite different. But yeah. um, it's, and, and you seem to be quite disconnected from all of that because you seem to be very focused in, well, this is my job. This is what I'm out to get. And that's it, right? Like nothing else, there's no noise sort of distracting you from from anything. But yeah, Anila, do you feel like as a journalist, you have done as much as you possibly can to inform the public or have you ever at any point thought I wish I could have done this or I wish I could have done that um I think I'd always feel like I can do more Mm. um especially during lockdown you know when you get lazy and (laughs) you take your eye off the ball for a bit and you're like oh there's been a really big announcement yeah (laughs) I wonder if my followers have noticed that I haven't tweeted yeah (laughs) um so there's always something, but I think that, you know, I have always said that the responsibility to people is is great and huge and that, you know, it come, giving people information comes with a huge responsibility. Mm. And so there's always something more to be done. There's always something more to give. There's always an idea that I have that I've not been able to make for whatever reason. I yeah. don't have the resources or whatever it might be. Um that I think, yeah, people really need this. Um, so, yeah, there's always more. There's mm. always more to give. And, Anila, apart from the work you do as a journalist and working in the media, you've got some of the side, interesting side projects that, that you're doing. So you mentioned one on, on the phone a few days ago. So do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Yes. So this is the Global Indian Creatives. So much for talking about all that uh, not <laughs> boxing yourself. <laughs> yourself. I'm really boxing myself. And in. here we are categorizing <laughs> everybody now. <laughs> here we are. Um, but again, this is using it for the greater good. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so it's a group called the Global Indian Creatives. And I've been working with them for about a year. There's, uh, yeah, there's five of us mm-hmm. uh, just making sure I've got everyone in there. <laughs> um, and I'm the uh, vice chairperson. So it's a group that puts Indian creatives on the map. And it's really, uh, you know, the greater good here is that we are helping people who come from kind of unprivileged, underrepresented places, backgrounds, um, who are extremely talented and just are banging at the door with their creative talent, but can't break through into the industry they want to get into or they can't you know they have no access to connections um and it's to help them connect with people who are at the top of that industry who Mm. are is like a top music artist top painter top singer top musician top journalist whatever it might be and um so we've created a forum where we can connect people um create mentoring sessions workshops and hopefully, mm. you know, take people on a journey where they're closer 
to their dream. You know, we say we're taking people to the top. It's the top of their skills and abilities, the top of, um, you know, the top people who are at the top of their game, taking them to the top of, you know, where they might want to be or, you know, want to reach. So, um, and really, you know, we've created this. I come from a background where I had no connections or network in media and journalism. Um, I had to go out to networking events and meet people myself and build my own connections. Um, So it's really, you know, it's from a personal perspective Mm. that it's helping people who are extremely talented who are finding it difficult to break through. And it's also to give the world a big bang. But, you know, here's this pool of Indian creatives. We're bridging a gap between India and the UK to begin with, but it is the global Indian creatives. People in other countries can take this, um, take this kind of, forum that we've created and implement it in their own countries so people in Spain Mm. might want to implement it with people in the USA Um, and creating this huge network to say you know if there's an acting position that comes up that requires a you know a future Aladdin on a stage play you don't have to find somebody who's non-Asian for the Mm. role you can find an Indian who is a really good actor who can fulfill that role. Wow and has all of this kicked off already or is it still in in the works? So um, we're slowly, slowly launching. We've done a soft launch online. So we did that a few weeks ago. Um, but yeah, we'll be releasing much more very soon. Great. Well, you can send me the, the links and I can share it with the listeners as well if anybody wants to get in touch. That'd be amazing. That'd be great. Thank so, you. Anila, we, we've spoken about so many amazing things. I mean, I could go on forever, really. But um, <laughs> <laughs> I have one last question for you, Anila. And that's, where do you see yourself in 10 years time and what do you want to achieve as as a journalist and well I don't want to say South Asian woman but as a as a female in this industry what do you what do you want to achieve and where do you see yourself? I could have answered this quite coherently probably uh, before the coronavirus pandemic but I (laughs) I interviewed um, the uh, Hollywood actor Rose McGowan who obviously you know started Mm. the whole Me Too movement And she said in my interview with her, um, when you make a plan, God laughs. I'm paraphrasing. And I Mm -hmm. never really understood what it meant because I was like, that was one thing that we kind of differed on because I was like, but how can you not make a plan? You know, we make one year plans, two year plans, five year and 10 year. That's just what everyone Mm -hmm. does. And she was just like, nope, I go with the flow and I, you know, just take life as it comes kind of thing and I I was just like okay Mm -hmm. you know that's cool um but now I get what she means and that's (laughs) one saying that has really played on my mind and stayed in my mind during this whole pandemic is that you make a plan and you just never know what's going to happen so Mm. I have all these visions of um things I'd like to achieve all these goals and plans and yet knowing me like I will do it because that's me and I do make plans yeah. but also um I also am very open to seeing where life takes me because that's part mm. of the journey too yeah no I I completely agree I think everyone's perception on life has changed quite significantly now uh, with this pandemic uh, not just in terms of how we see our own lives but our relationships with specific people in our life and there's probably certain things we, we won't take for granted now. Mm. Um, but and also, Anila, just, I just want... also just that whole thing of um, what's important. Like we're always, you know, before the pandemic, it was a huge rat race of, we're, yeah. you know, we're so busy doing all these small tasks that we think are so important that can't wait. And, you know, we've got to be on our emails at midnight because it can't mm-hmm. wait. And it's that putting it into perspective that what is really important and what am I going to now dedicate my time to that actually will make a difference and have an impact. So mm, it's more of that. Yeah. Really. yeah. Well, Anita, I'm, I'm very excited to see what's coming up with your projects and your uh, your ideas over the next few years. I'm sure you've got a lot lined up. Um, but uh, thank you for everything that you're doing as a journalist as well. Um, and as a doctor, uh, we really appreciate people like you who are putting the real stories out um, and also giving the real heroes a voice in this time because now is when they need it more than ever. Mm. Um, so I just want to say thank you from not just from me, but from all the doctors and healthcare workers across the country. Just thank you so much. 
Well, Mino, thank you for the work that you're doing and to all the incredible doctors and NHS staff out there because Yeah. Um, because let's see how long we, let's we see how long we have to clap for though. <laughs> I realized well, I, I woke up this I morning, think... I was like, Oh, it's Thursday. <laughs> Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. We've got to clap tonight. But um, I think the other thing that's really important is that the stories don't get lost after this. That's one thing that I'm definitely going to make sure yeah. I do is um, continue the story of mm. the NHS staff and um, doctors and nurses to make sure that I think the one thing that I would like to focus on next really is their well-being, their mental well-being, yeah. because, yeah. you know, we say that, you know, soldiers go into an army and they get PTSD. This has been a silent war just because mm. we can't see it. The people who have actually been in A&E, they have yeah. seen it and they are facing that battle every day and um, and they're at risk and they're putting their lives at risk every day knowing that, you know, I will inevitably catch coronavirus, but I have to be here doing my job. So um, the next thing that we really need to focus on is the well-being of the staff who have mm. been on the front line. Yeah, I, I think there will be a lot of sort of after effects of this virus, not just with healthcare workers, but even just people from the public, especially the elderly who've had to isolate for so many weeks. Gosh, yeah. They, they, they will also have to to come to terms with what's happened. But um, thank you, Anila, again. Thank, thank you for your you. time. And hopefully we'll cross paths again very soon. I'm sure we will. And thank you, dear listeners, for tuning in again to another episode of Meenal's World. Uh, That was episode 14. Uh, I mean, I don't know where the last 14 weeks have gone. It's really been an incredible ride. And so much has happened. So many things I didn't plan. Um, You know, we've we've made it to the top of iTunes. We made it to even Sarvan now in in India. Geo Sarvan have promoted us as well. So we're doing very, very well. And I I just want to ask you to, to let me know what you like every week. Do you like me interviewing people? Do you want to know more about my life? Uh, I talk a lot about my life and my personal journeys through, through Instagram mainly. Uh, that's the medium that I use to discuss more personal stuff. And on Instagram as well, I will start doing an Instagram TV series where I update you on my life. And I answer your questions because I don't really get a chance to do that on the podcast. So you can follow me on Instagram at Meenal's World and Twitter and Facebook as well. Same handle at Meenal's World. Uh, you can also find out more about what I do on my website, which is meenalsworld.com. And of course, thank you for listening every week. And if there's anything that I can do to help you, if there's anything I can do to help your family in terms of in- informing people, educating you, on a specific topic please let me know this is what i'm here to do and i will see you all next week stay indoors if you're living (laughs) in the uk and if you're living elsewhere just follow what the government says and this will be over very soon so i'll see you all next week